Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is our last technical session of our summit uh, for this summer. So for our last session, we're going to have a kind of working group discussion uh, with Peter Grahan and myself and a few others about Beehive. So let me see. I, Peter gave me some slides. I'm going to go grab those and share them. And actually, we also need to find Peter. He was on Zoom, but I don't see him now. Well, <clears throat> amusingly enough, I've managed to not find the slides I'm supposed to present. Uh, da, 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 da. There is a one can have too many open windows, it turns out, to try to find the right one in Zoom. Oh, there's Peter. Uh, can I just test um, my screen share? Yeah, since mine is not cooperating, why don't you go for it? How's that? Yes, excellent. Thank you for rescuing my inability to get preview to work. <laughs> oh, did... Um... You need. A, you have a PDF that you wanted to um, display. No, I, I thought you were going to have me display them. So I was trying to. Get oh, to okay. But that's all right. We're all good. Charge ahead. Um. Oh, are we on now? Yes. All right. Um. So, uh, I guess we don't have a whole lot of time. So. Um, that's okay. The schedule is kind of shot, but it's all right. This is the last yeah. technical thing of the day, so we, we, we'll be fun. We don't have a special thing afterwards today, so it's okay. Yeah, so John and I were just going to um, have a bit of a talk about Beehive. I've got a small um, presentation just about some upcoming work. I mean, there's a lot more that uh, I'm not covering, um, but I just decided to kind of randomly pick some stuff, probably more the things that I guess um, I've been looking at. Um, I'm not sure if Andy is around. I guess we're hoping for an ARM update. I'll go see. And the other thing is, um, if anybody has questions, we can just answer them on the fly. Okay. And Andy is here. I've, 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 he should be able to join us. All right. So let me just... Uh, run through these. All right, so I've got just a small set of projects here. They're listed in increasing order of complexity and um, decreasing probability that they're going to get done anytime soon. So first up is Vert.io. Um, 
Beehive's initial device models were only Vert.io. There's been a whole lot added since then, but it's still kind of the workhorse, uh, certainly for Linux VMs and um, FreeBSD, maybe not so much Windows. Um, but uh, the implementation in Beehive is kind of from, you know, 2013 timeframe. The first spec uh, was fairly simplistic. Um, it's the version number is actually called 0.9.5. I don't know why. Um, but in the, it's almost seven, eight years since that was done. There's been a number of spec updates and probably the most important one was Vert.io version one. And um, they kind of rationalized uh, some of the data structures that are, are shared between a host and a guest. It's not, not really that different. Um, but what's happened is that uh, some guests only support version one, they don't support the older version. And some of the device types are only described in version one, there's no 0.9.5. So the longer Beehive supports that, um, the more problems we're going to have with um, guests not supporting it. Probably the most recent one that came up was Vert.io input that went in. Uh, it's actually not supported on Linux in anything other than version one, so we can't use it there. Um, however, uh, there is um, some work uh, that has been done for this, which upgrades or at least provides all of the infrastructure to upgrade to version 1.0, uh, 1.1. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to put that in soon. Um, one of the problems that we have with Vodo or having to support multiple versions of Vodo is that um, at a minimum, you want a way to specify which version you want, but you also kind of want the default version to be the latest possible version. But then you have the other problem that, you know, when somebody creates VM, you really want that version to be frozen in time. So we kind of have this problem where um, you don't really want to uh, be locked into the oldest possible version forever and never be able to move forward. Um, but it's not quite clear how to really represent that. I mean, having to put in a version every single time is kind of a bit of a headache for users. They really shouldn't really, they shouldn't need to know these low level details. Um, so that's kind of an open question with this work is, uh, you know, how do we um, try to move forward, but at the same time, uh, not break when we update what the default version is. And the other problem we have is that because there's, you know, older OSs that only support 0.9.5, like if you want to run a FreeBSD 10 VM, um, you know, there's, there's really kind of a compatibility jump between 0.95 and one that if we only support one, we can't work on 0.9. 0.9.5. So one proposal I have right at the end there is just, if we actually just change the name from vertio dash device to just VIO, and then we leave vertio dash is just a way of specifying kind of the, the existing format. So anybody that has an existing config will stay locked into 0.9.5 forever, but that should be okay because that's what they're working with now. But then if we have a new name, then we can kind of move forward and say that that tracks version updates and then that could also have a version specified with it. So um, I'm very interested to know what people uh, think about that. Mm. <clears throat> My initial thought might be, I wonder if we can just have a Vertio version that defaults to the right thing, but I guess you want it to track in the future and not be fixed at 095 as a default forever. So I have to think more about if that would work. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be stuck at 0.9.5. I mean, this, you know, say for example, for Vodio input, it's it's not really very useful at 0.9.5. It only supports Windows, and yeah, you know, we already have X working XHCI for Windows to get uh, input, so it's not it's not so. It, I mean, we could actually just cut 0.9.5 support for that because it hasn't shipped yet. 
and and that would be the same for any additional new device that we supported, like if we ever do Vertio um, GPU or something like that. Um, but it's more a case for, you know, Vertio and Vertio Block, which are the kind of two most commonly used devices. Right, yeah. It probably only really matters for them because like even random, I don't think it would break anybody one way or the other. All right, the next one on my list is um, what I call external USB. So uh, Beehive has a um, XHCI USB controller emulation. Uh, there's currently only one device model which um, is behind that and that's the USB tablet. But uh, in theory, we could put anything we want there. The controller emulation is quite complete. Um, however, it's there's kind of limitations with that. When you connect a device, it's stuck there for the lifetime of the VM and it can't be changed. Where for USB, what you really want is something which is how it's used in real life where you have a physical cable and a plug and you can just walk up to a machine and plug it in. So uh, that's kind of useful for a, a lot of different reasons. Um, so my proposal for this is to have a model which is just called remote and it's basically just a proxy where uh, because USB is already a message based protocol and it already handles attach and detach, um, we can just have, for example, a Unix domain socket, which uh, just has a um, message based version of USB that goes across it. And then we could have the USB device model be external to the Beehive process. Um, and you just implement the device model there. Uh, so this, this would be one way that you could emulate plugging a USB stick into a Beehive VM. Uh, or if you have a, um, a USB device that you wanted to pass through into Beehive into a VM that was already started, you could just detach it and then you know, run some kind of daemon that just uses LibUSB to talk to that device and then uses the remote protocol to um, talk to, to, to the hypervisor. Um, and also, uh, you could write device models in whatever way or language you wanted to. So, for example, you could write a Python script that could emulate a, a USB device. Uh, and this allows functionality to be added to Beehive, um, you know, outside of a release schedule, um, because you could just write a port that emulated a particular USB device, uh, because Beehive doesn't really have to look at any of the semantics of these messages. Uh, you could write, as long as a guest understands that device, you can add that functionality um, to the hypervisor without having to modify the hypervisor itself. Um, it turns out there's a whole lot of different ways of uh, running USB over the wire. Linux has USB IP, which is sort of abandoned. Um, RDP has a remote USB protocol. Uh, the SPICE protocol, I guess it's kind of the QMU specific version of VNC. It also has a remote USB protocol. Uh, they all seem to have advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's not clear that, that even implementing any of those um, would be better or worse than just doing a custom version. So I'm still not really sure what path to go down with that. Um, I haven't really done too much on this yet. One thing I've done is um, Linux has a bunch of test function uh, devices that are very simple, like just echo data from one USB pipe to another. So I have a software implementation of that and also have a hardware implementation of that on a Raspberry, Raspberry Pi Pico, um, which can be used to kind of test proxying against real hardware just for a very simple device. But um, there's still a long way to go with this. All right, the next one on the list is GPU pass-through. So this has kind of been kicking around for a long time. I think it's um, been resurrected with a whole bunch of patches that we received from Corvin Cohn, who's from Beckhoff. And he's given us um, a pretty large patch set for Intel GBTD, which is pass-through for an integrated uh, GPU. Uh, he's also given us one for, a, um, AMD APU, uh, but they're quite large and there's sort of a lot of dependencies on other parts of Beehive changing. So 
in particular, the 64-bit PCI support for pass-through in Beehive is, um, it was a little too specific. The initial version required a Xeon that had um, a large um, number of physical address lines that didn't really work on desktop machines that have in Intel integrated GPUs. So we've had to fix that, but then that there's a cascading required change that's needed in EFI because EFI advertises where the 64-bit hole is uh, to the guest that's running. And then we have to dynamically modify what are currently static tables. Um, so there's more work there. Um, we also seem to need PCI ROM support to initialize uh, GPUs after they've been reset. Um, there's sort of a change of that that came in with some VGA work. Um, so it's, it, on the surface, it sounds like it's not that big a job, but there's just a whole lot of cascading changes um, that have to be done to support it. Um, the other issue too with uh, just entire controller pass-through is you either need a dedicated graphics card and a separate monitor, um, or it takes over the, you know, your existing monitor. And that's probably not too friendly if you have a, a graphic system and you just want to run like a VM in a window. So the solution, at least from Intel for that is called GBTG, uh, which enables you to carve up an Intel integrated GPU into a number of kind of smaller sections. And then you have a slightly modified way of pass through where a guest can access just a portion of the GPU hardware. But to do that, we actually have to modify the Linux DRM code because there's a whole lot of hooks in that to handle this. Um, so that actually seems a fairly complicated piece of work because we have an in-tree portion and then we have an out-of-tree portion and we have to somehow glue those together. Um, NVIDIA's uh, high-end solution is just standard SRIOV. Um, so I think that actually might have the most chance of success without changing anything, but it's also the most expensive. Um, so I don't know, I had plans to do work on GBTG, but um, I've just never really been able to carve out enough time to get to it. And last on my list is uh, moving Beehive to a uh, single process model. So currently there's kind of these separate admin actions of creating a virtual machine, running a virtual machine, and then destroying a virtual machine. Uh, and there's multiple processes involved there. Uh, and the problem is that there's a resource that's created that lives sort of on its own. It's not really tied to any process. So um, this is one of the reasons why Beehive still runs as root because you don't want to give people the ability to create, um, you know, these objects that use a lot of system resources um, and can, you know, severely impact the operation of the system when these people uh, aren't privileged users. Um, however, if it's tied to a process, kind of like anything in Unix, the resources that are used by a process are accounted for and uh, there's a whole lot of um, limits that you can apply to a process. And then also, uh, you know, you can re reclaim those resources just by killing that process. So this is how QMU works, or KVM works on Linux. Um, it's definitely kind of fits more into the Unix model. Um, however, the problem that we have with Beehive is that we have to be able to migrate from this kind of separate model that we have into this single process model. And the most obvious places where that shows up is where we have an external loader like Beehive Load or Grub Beehive, which kind of run as a separate process and create this VM object. Um, so for Grub Beehive, there's kind of less and less people using that. Um, EFI works pretty good with almost all Linux distributions and has for quite a few years now. So I think, and also Grub Beehive is, um, it's not really being maintained, doesn't support XFS properly. I know Chuck, Tuff, Chuck Tuffley has done a sort of an updated version of that, but it might be simpler just to uh, retire Grub Beehive. 
Um, beehive load for running FreeBSD is still quite useful. And I think we can kind of mimic um, the way it works with a single process just by starting a process in beehive load and then backgrounding it. And then when you run beehive, it actually just picks up the existing process that was created. Um, so we're not actually, we, we still have a, an object that's tied to a process. It's just hidden from the user, but it will at least allow them to carry forward scripts that they have and beehive load itself is still kind of a useful tool. Um, so the other um, reason for doing this, as I mentioned, it, it kind of provides a way to not have to be root to run a virtual machine um, because now we have all the resources tied to an actual process. Um, you know, we can use existing um, limiting um, whatever mechanism you want just to restrict what an actual uh, non-root user can do. And, you know, the ultimate way of controlling this is you just kill the process that's associated with the VM. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure there's probably a lot of things that I haven't thought of here, but at least that's, that's the path that I want to move to, to be able to allow non-root users to uh, run VMs. Um, yep, that's all I had. I mean, there's probably 20 more of these, but uh, we've only got 30 minutes and we probably want yep. to talk about other things. And well, then there's lots of other stuff in progress by lots of different folks. I know for myself, um, mostly I've just tried, I've been spending what time I have for Beehive kind of trying to see if I can shepherd in some other things. I have a long backlog of things to help with. Um, probably next to my plate are some of the suspend and resume fixes uh, that other people have contributed, as well as some other follow-up patches from UPB on suspend and resume. Um, but I don't know one chunk of exciting work is uh, work on ARM64, which the folks at UPB have worked on, but also Andy Turner has worked on. And so Andy's here. I don't know if, Andy, you might be able to do a demo of ARM64 booting in a VM under uh, yeah, I have one. I can work out how to share screen. screen. Sure. Um, hopefully, you can see a um, my screen now. Yeah. At least one window. And I so I'm I. This is a. Uh, I have a free. This is a FreeBSD machine in the room next to me running a fairly recent or a current version of uh, FreeBC 14 on an ARM64 machine on ARM64. So it's a, it's a one of the, um, it's an in, in the Neo VC1 development platform that ARM has, has loaned us. Um, so I've got been testing and updating the Beehive code from UPB to um, fix a few issues we found and get it into a state that we I think we are happy with. So uh, you can see the script at the top I've been running. I'm running, it just runs. I've more, I'm already running the single, or almost a single process model um, because I only support run it booting from EFI on ARM64. So. If we if we were to have a single process model, it would be a lot. We we wouldn't have a problem with ARM sixty four at all. With this. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm okay. So I can boot into U boot. I'm not sure why I get a random piece of garbage on the UART. Um, I've I've traced traced it, and I sort of got no idea. Um, but you can see it booting the FreeBSD loader loader. Um, and standard FreeBSD. So performance-wise, is it kind of comparable to bare metal and kind of um, the same way as it is on x86? I'm not really sure. This is, this is also a netboot machine. So some of the, I may, we like this issue, we may be seeing some, like it's hanging here may just be because it's trying to load the disk off the network 
uh, which might, seems to sometimes be a little unstable. Uh, but for development, it's fine. Development of Beehive, it's fine. I, I would like to you know, actually run a performance, see what the performance is like. I have got disk in this, in this, um, the, the, this, this server it's running in, but I haven't tried um, right booting off, be booting from Beehive off that. And this is another place where I need to look into why it's suddenly slow. Yeah, try a um, MD5-T or OpenSSL speed. Uh, yeah, I, know, well, I haven't looked at any of this. I can, so, so, so what command was it? Open your cell. Oh, MD5-T is a simple one. Yeah, it looks pretty good. This is speed. Oh, open open SSL open. speed and then say SHA two five six, for example. Uh, I, I I think no no dashes in front of speed. It's just speed oh, okay. as a command to open SSL. Yeah, so I think uh, you might have a problem with the clock because yeah, the time. Uh, it's in my. Um, I haven't looked at that. Was my next look at is the the clock. Uh, I've been focusing recently on um, getting the interrupt controller right, and there's a few still a few issues um, around. Still need to look into level versus edge interrupts and. Um, Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. I should look at the clock once I've got I finished off this interrupt controller issue, and it's possibly also related to that. that oh yeah, point. I think I've broken um, the clock while I've updated the interrupts. Yeah, the speed the speed test runs for three seconds. It just sets a like a SIG alarm, so if times aren't working, yeah, it probably won't come back. Okay, I can look into that later then. Um, and I haven't, I haven't tried to do builds or anything inside of this yet. Most of my testing has just been, does it boot? Well, that tends to test a lot of things as it is. Hmm. Um, cool. And I have, I'm also tried to boot Linux and NetBSD, but Linux will start to boot. Um, NetBSD, I get I don't even get any kernel output yet. So I those are more a couple more things to look into. And I haven't I haven't tried any other operating systems yet. Okay. Well, I think we're actually probably close to the end of the time that we have uh, for our slot today. But that was very cool. Thank you for sharing, Andy. And thank you for your updates, Peter. Um, it is interesting to see how Beehive continues to evolve and grow um, and become a bigger and bigger thing within FreeBSD itself. It's always more stuff for it to do. Um, but thank you, guys. So let's do another five-minute break uh, real quick. This will be our last break. For the oh, we actually have some questions. Let me see. Ah, so. Um, uh, we'll take a stab at these two questions before I run into our break. Um, Jason Tubner has asked, the status of live storage resize in Beehive Guests? That's an interesting question. So um, I actually have a, a patch series. It's mostly been reviewed, and I have some feedback from Peter I need to address that adds the ability for Beehive to notice, uh, at least for Vertio block, if uh, underlying block, the underlying storage changes size, it propagates and tells the underlying guests and the guests kind of notices and resizes automatically. Um, so that's kind of in progress and I should finish addressing the feedback I got from Peter so I can push it upstream. It doesn't 
support uh, Zvols currently because Zvols will need they need to support the KVIT to raise a KVIT when their file size changes. But I've, from what I've looked at, it shouldn't be hard to add that to Zvols. Um, and then Jason has a follow up question: Will that be easy to port to NVMe? Um, probably, as long as NVMe has some kind of way to notify the host, like normally in NVMe, that a, a, a storage is resized. As long as we have an interrupt, we can post. Um, it should just be a matter of wiring up the right bits in the NVMe model to do that. So assuming NVMe, the protocol is a way to do that, it shouldn't be hard to add it. And then Alan Jude, oh, and Chuck already said, yes, I have patches for that, outstanding. Um, Alan Jude had asked a question, I think, of Andy, which was, was Andy's demo running on an M1 Mac Mini? Uh, the, no. The other. I have oh. a I have a Mac Mini, M1 Mac Mini, but the uh, the commands you we are running under a FreeBSD on a VMware on a an older Mac Mini, an Intel based one, and Beehive was it was SSH into a Beehive. Um, and uh, well, so the the NFS servers on the Mac Mini actually, but and is this is into a, into a beehive into a FreeBSD booting on an N1 STP, which is the um, ne um, nearest N1 reference platform. Okay. And then one more question uh, we have, which is: Are there any plans to support QXL for Windows guests? I'm going to punt to Peter because I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so that's a um, uh, a third IO um, mm. um, kind of GPU power virtualization. Um, so um, I think Hei Hing actually had a working. He might he might have. So this I think there's a couple of different variants of this as well. It's the terminology gets a little confusing. I'm probably confused myself now. But basically, it's it's just a way to sort of do, you know, like open OpenGL like um, API pass through, so that you can get 3D in a guest without having to implement, you know, a full GPU device model. Um, so the problem, the main problem with that is just the fact that we don't have any 3D graphics in the FreeBSD base system, but Beehive ships in the base system. So for something for something like this to work. We would need the ability to, um, you know, be able to have uh, like a dynamically loadable third I/O device model that could then link against um, some three D libraries that came from ports, and then at runtime, you know, Beehive could incorporate that. Um, that's probably useful uh, in general, and not just for something like QXL. But that's why it can't happen um, right now. Okay, and then we had one other question here, which is someone has a couple of NVIDIA A100s and is asking if there's anything they can do for help. I guess this is maybe in regards to testing SROV. Um, but I mean, yeah, aside just... from testing it, letting us know if it's broken, perhaps, I'm not sure. Absolutely, yep. And if they, you know, we could always supply updated patches for them to try out to see uh, how things go. Yes. Okay. We have another minute or two to see if any other questions pop up. Okay. Well, thank you again, Peter and Andy. Um, and we'll take about a five minute break. As a reminder, after our break, we're gonna do our closing session. And one of the things we're gonna do in our closing session is we're going to do a FreeBSD trivia game, as it were, uh, using the app Kahoot. Uh, you can use a web browser client to do it, or you can use an app on your phone or a tablet. So we'll post some links to, to remind us to Kahoot in the chat. So you can use this time during the break to download Kahoot on your phone if you don't have it, get it set up. And we'll see you all in about five minutes.